Welcome back to another session of the Teaching Saints Virtual Summit. Uh, this is one of the ones we've done more recently than not with when we recorded the the majority of the sessions. But we're we're our plan is to add sessions onto this summit, this library, uh, as we go. As you know, we're never done learning about teaching and and how to do so more effectively. And so we're going to keep adding these sessions uh, onto this summit. And today I have the opportunity to sit down with Ben Wilcox. How are you, Ben? Doing great. How are you, Kurt? Very good. Now, uh, people may be familiar with your voice, but maybe not so much with uh, your face. So put yourself into context. Uh, who are you and, and what makes you uh, worthy of this stage of teaching? <laughs> well, I don't know about uh, worthy of this stage or not, but, uh, but no, I've been a teacher for a long time. Um, I've been in the, uh, the church's seminary program, Seminary and Institute for the past 20 years. Um, I grew up in a house, uh, a church in church education. And um, uh, my dad is a, is a speaker and an author. And so the scriptures have always been a big part of, of my life. And so just recently, this past year, I started a YouTube channel um, called Teaching with Power. And, I, you know, at first, I started it out and wondered if anybody would really even watch or, or even care what I had to say, but it's been really fun. It's been really cool to see that uh, it's uh, grown uh, fairly quickly and, uh, and has been able to help a, a few people out. I just, I feel super privileged to be able to share my love of the scriptures with so many people each week. Awesome. And, uh, and you focus on the come follow me lesson, you know, week to week. Right. And, but you do so like there's some, you know, there's a handful of these uh, different, YouTube channels that are approaching Come Follow Me, and and some do it, in, each one sort of has their own spin on it, and you sort of approach it as from the teacher standpoint. Like, if I was going to teach this lesson, here's some strategies, some tactics, some points of view that may help you in more effectively teaching it, not just absorbing and learning the content, right? Yeah, yeah, that's kind of the the niche that I'm uh, approaching it with. Um, I just the kind of, one of the part one of the things that inspired me to do it was with the new come follow me program where president nelson is asking parents and uh family members to be teachers everybody is a teacher of the scriptures i mean really honestly that, that's what we do in the church we are a church of teachers um no matter even if it's not your calling you know you may be a primary teacher you might be a uh, Sunday school teacher, um, but uh, even if you don't have a calling that's based around teaching, we're all ministers. We're all supposed to be missionaries. Uh, we uh, we teach our families, and and so it's just we need to be effective teachers. And um, most of us, uh, that's not that's not our profession. So it can be a little intimidating. It can be a little challenging. So I thought with my experience and, uh, and, and my love of the scriptures that maybe I'd be able to offer some help, um, some ideas. So that's my approach is, Hey, here, you're going to be teaching this. Where do I begin? Uh, what are some insights that I could share some questions that work? What's a good way to begin the lesson to kind of grab their attention. And, uh, yeah, I think that kind of sets the channel apart a little bit that, uh, yeah. that's my approach. Um, instead of just, uh, here, here are some thoughts or insights from the scriptures. Yeah, that's perfect. And that's exactly why I wanted to have you part of this, uh, this summit and, and to have your uh, perspective in the, in the library of all these experienced teachers. So tell us, I mean, what, what do you hope to cover today in this session? And, and let's jump into it. Let's uh, see what we can learn. Yeah, great. Yeah, I, you know, I did. I, I spent uh, some time going back through your library of the, uh, the teaching uh, virtual summit. And just some amazing people you got uh, and some great skills and techniques. And as I was watching those, and I learned a lot myself, so I was really grateful to go through that. Oh, cool. But uh, um, I kind of was thinking, okay, what can I offer that's unique? Um, what, what, what more could I give? Because a lot of those, those same skills and, and ideas uh, I definitely agree with. But I thought it might be good to go over the big picture um, approach it from the standpoint of, you know, here you are, you're a teacher, you're going to be teaching a lesson this Sunday, you're going to teach your family a come follow me lesson. What approach should you take? What 
uh, what direction or focus should you take as you sit down and try to, to prepare a lesson for somebody? So I kind of want to look at the, the big picture is, is Perfect. what I was hoping to do. Awesome. So where do we begin? Well, um, I, one, of the, one of the scriptures that comes to mind that I kind of take as a guide for, for how I approach teaching the scriptures, I love um, Alma 31.5. And uh, you've got uh, Alma here, and he's going to teach the Zoramites. And he says, And now, as the preaching of the word had a great tendency to lead the people to do that which was just, yea, it had had more powerful effect upon the minds of the people than the sword, or anything else which had happened unto them. Therefore, Alma thought it was expedient that they should try the virtue of the word of God. And, and what I love about that verse, that last line is really intriguing to me, trying the virtue of the word of God, right? It's, it's the word that has the power. That's where we need to focus our attention and our lessons. Although uh, sometimes I think a teacher, they look at their, their lesson plan, they, they look down there, they're going to teach this, this certain uh, section of scriptures, and they're like, okay, I need some movies, I need uh, some questions. I, 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 I'm going to focus on um, trying to get people to feel a certain way. And if that's their approach, uh, that, may not, uh, that may not be as powerful as perhaps just the word itself. And so that's the way that I approach. When I sit down, I'm thinking, okay, you know what? I don't have to come up with the power here um, in the scriptures. It's, it's already baked in. The scriptures themselves have the authority. And so, yes, there's a lot of other things that I can go to um, that might help to amplify that or help that, but my meat and potatoes have got to be the word, the virtue of the word itself. Um, I think sometimes I, well, do an example here, maybe a teacher would use a technique as the center of their lesson or the way that they approach it. Um, one of the techniques in the past that I think the church is trying to get away from is lecture. Right, the teacher just gets up and here I am. I know everything. Listen to me, stand and deliver. And I think that that can oftentimes lack power if that's the only thing you're going to do. On the other hand, I think sometimes we've kind of swung the other way too, where somebody says, "Okay, it's discussion. Uh, my lesson is going to be all discussion." And so all I need to do as a teacher is I'm going to get up and I'm going to ask questions. And uh, then my class is going to answer. Well, that's important too. Like we need to ask questions. It can't be all stand and deliver. But if, if all we do is just ask questions, then it kind of becomes a lecture from the three most outgoing people in the class. Right? <laughs> Isn't that true? Yeah. yeah I mean, if you've ever had that experience uh, and, and the teacher asks a question and those same people kind of give their opinion and and I, I have to think about that. And I say, you know, I really want to try to teach the way the Savior taught. And is that the way the Savior taught? Did he sit down with the apostles and just say, all right, let's, let's get together and let's decide on what the truth is? Um, no, no, he, he taught the truth. He, mm -hmm. he, he, he said, here is the word. Here is the truth. Did he ask questions? Yeah, uh, a lot of questions. He spent a lot of time asking questions, but I guess there was, there was a good balance. That's what we got to try to find as teachers as far as techniques are concerned. But really, I mean, I guess that's what I kind of want to get away with. Uh, the techniques are important. I do a little bit of that. I, I do some teacher presentation. I do some questions and some discussion and, um, and stories. You know, there's lots of different techniques that we can use in teaching, but those are, those are the spice. Right? Yeah. They're, not, they're not the meal. They're not the main course. The word, the scriptures should be the main course. And then I yeah. use those other things to kind of to help it along. Yeah. I, I really appreciate the sort of that, uh, the, the spectrum that you, you paint there as far as on, on one end is going to be very lecture heavy. And on the other end, it's just sort of like the wild west in the classroom. Like we're just having some questions and we'll just see where we end up. And I, I've definitely uh, maybe air towards the, you know, asking maybe too many questions or leaving more open because uh, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm a little more comfortable in sort of not, not sure where this is going to go, you know, but I can see how that can be as dangerous 
or not dangerous, but just as un, unproductive as, as just lecturing. So it's really finding that, that sweet spot, right. Of asking questions and let, having them wrestle there, but uh, don't, don't turn this too much into a lecture. And I love the point that it is true. If you, if you just say, I'm not going to be the lecturer, I'm going to let the class do the talking. Then you, there's two or three people that could dominate the class talking, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. And I also, I would say, so who should do most of the talking in my mind, it should be the scriptures should do most of the talking. Hmm. Um, if you're doing a lesson in, you know, you book of Mormon this year, uh, let Nephi teach the lesson. You know, um, let Enos teach the lesson. Let, let Captain Moroni teach the lesson rather than me or the three most outgoing people. Um, we kind of have that, yeah, like you said, you kind of have that sweet spot. You're looking for that sweet spot in the middle where you do as a teacher, I believe, have a responsibility to do some teaching, um, to, to do some presenting. Um, from what your experience is. I mean, you, you're the one who's, who studied. You're the one who's approached it with, uh, you know, with the spirit. You've studied, you've prepared, you know a little bit more about it. So I think you do have a responsibility to, to share a little bit. Yeah. But again, you know, don't dominate the class. Let, let the scriptures dominate the class, really. Yeah. And, and I, and I appreciate this dynamic that you bring up that I don't feel like we, we really think about it enough as far as like the, the dynamic teacher. I mean, we've all been in these rooms with, uh, with teachers who are just phenomenal at how they work the room. I mean, their presentation style, yeah, I, I hate to label it, but it's almost like the, the, like the elder Holland dynamic, right? Like everybody just loves elder Holland. And I wish I could teach like elder, right? Holland. <laughs> but it, it almost makes me, and everybody has their style, right? And it's not like elder Holland gives better talks than elder Bednar or whatever. It's just, they all have their, their unique style. And, uh, and it would be interesting for them to just mix up their talk and, and everybody read somebody else's talk because it probably wouldn't work. But so I, I think what uh, what I'm excited to get in this discussion is what do we do about that dy dynamic teacher, you know, concept? Because sometimes you have this awesome teacher that's teaching Sunday school and they've been doing it for five years and you can't even imagine this person being released because they do such a good job, but then they do get released or they get another calling. And now you or somebody else has to step forward and you think like, Oh, I can't do it like them, you know? So I think what we're going to discover here is some, some helpful ways to avoid or still survive even when we don't have that dynamic teacher. Yeah. Yeah. And like you said, like every teacher is different and every teacher has their strengths and weaknesses. And I think heavenly father makes up the rest. Yeah. Um, if we put our trust in him, if we, if we don't feel like we need to provide the power and, and that's, if there was a teacher like that, they're, they're coming in and they're trying to replace a very dynamic or experienced teacher. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to give you, I'm going to let you off the hook a little bit here. Yeah. And, and just remind you that you do not have to create the power. It's already in the scriptures. If, if you feel like you have to do it, if you try to take that responsibility on yourself, like you've got to spiritually manipulate the room or, or you've got to be the one to bring the, the show, um, then you might struggle with that. That might be hard. But if you just realize, you know, I don't have to create any kind of power. It's already there. Heavenly Father wouldn't allow, I mean, his, <laughs> he wouldn't allow us to, to take that sacred responsibility of teaching his word to somebody else and just leave us out to dry, hanging out to dry. Like, you've got to do this all on your own. He's like, here, let me, let me help you. I've got, I've got the power right there. The virtue of the word of God is going to do all the work. So you can kind of get that, that monkey off your back of feeling like you have to, to bring it. Uh, if you just focus on teaching the scriptures and the word, then I think you'll find that you'll have an edifying lesson. I think it's the, you know, I don't know if you've heard of the 80-20 principle. It's like the scriptures are like the 80 part, you know, all the charisma and the sense of humor and the skill and the experience, uh, that's just like the other 20% that can kind of help and is, is nice and, and, and it can make a little bit of a difference. But anybody, somebody who has never stood in front of a class can still have a powerful gospel teaching experience. Yeah. 
if they put I, their trust in the spirit and they put their trust in the scriptures, they, they yeah, can I appreciate put, that, that perspective as far as putting in the context of like where the source of the power is, because on the one end, when you have maybe a, someone who's less experienced is maybe more shy and they think how on earth am I going to be able to, you know, muster up this power within me or they have people on the other side and I always have to put myself in check. You know, I have lots and lots of public speaking experience. And so I can walk into a room and sort of feel like I'm good. Like I got the power right here, but it sort of makes me step back and be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's recognize where the source of the power is. You're, you're pretty slick up there, you know, Kurt, that's great, but you're not the source of the power. And, and we can almost, almost act like we are when, and when we can't, because that's not going to get the message as deep to the heart as, as the, the real source of the power. Right. I mean, that's what I've told people, uh, the, the name of my channel, uh, it's Teaching with Power. And I tell them, uh, don't, don't, get, don't get this wrong. Uh, the power is not from me. It's not from the insights. It's not the questions. The power comes from two sources. The power comes from the scriptures and it comes from the spirit. So if you rely on the spirit and you rely on the word, on the word of the scriptures, then you'll, you'll be fine. You'll, you'll do just great. And that's where that power is going to come from because the scriptures themselves, they, they just have it. Like, I'll give you an example of this. Um, when I was first called as Bishop, uh, I was really, um, I was really nervous to try to counsel people. You know, uh, people are going to come in and they were going to ask me about their marriages and a crisis of faith or helping their children. And I'm like, man, I, I'm not, I'm not a counselor. I, I'm not a, I don't have any uh, schooling in that. But what I found what was really cool was when people came in and they asked me questions, one thing I do know is the scriptures. And uh, they would ask me these questions or they bring these problems and certain verses or stories would come up from the scriptures in my mind. I was like, well, hey, you know, that sounds a lot like the brother of Jared, or that sounds a lot like like uh, what happened to this lady with, with Jesus and let's, let's go there. And it's amazing the change that makes for them. Uh, I'll give you an example. There was a woman in my ward who was really struggling. I mean, she was struggling financially. Um, she was divorced and, and uh, she was struggling with her son and just everything was kind of going wrong in her life. And she's like, Bishop, it doesn't seem like heavenly father's there helping me. I'm praying, I'm praying. And just doesn't seem like he's doing anything for me. And you know, and I'm trying to help her. And, and then the story of Jesus and the apostles on the Sea of Galilee came to mind. And I'm like, you know, do you kind of feel like the apostles in that situation? You remember that story? Like, there's a storm and they're about to sink. They feel like they're sinking. And they look over and Jesus is sleeping, right? And, and Peter runs over and shakes him and he says, Jesus, carest thou not that we perish? I mean, don't you care? That's what, that's what Peter thinks is the issue, that Jesus doesn't care. And I said, do you kind of feel that way? You know, that you feel like your boat's sinking and, you know, where, where's, the, where's the Lord at the time when I need him most? And uh, she said, yeah. And it was just amazing. Like, she just leaned in a little bit more. And there was a change in the feel of the room. There was more of a connection. It was more focused. Like, okay, this is the scriptures that are teaching me, not, not Bishop Wilcox. This is, the, the Lord is going to teach me through the scriptures. And so we just went through that story and we're like, you know what? Did Jesus care about the apostles? Was it that he didn't care? He's like, no, it wasn't that he didn't care. And I said, why was he sleeping then? And we came to the conclusion that it was because Jesus wasn't worried. Like he knew the end from the beginning of his story. And his story was not going to end in a shipwreck on Galilee. It was going to end on a cross. So he could sleep in that situation because he's like, it's going to be okay. I mean, I know that this is not how it ends. Yeah. So I said, maybe that's why you're feeling this way. It's not that he doesn't care. He's, he's aware of you. He's there. But he just maybe knows the end from the beginning. And he's not worried. He knows you can handle this. He knows that your boat's not going to sink. But just make sure he's in your boat, right? Yeah. Because if he's not in your boat, then, you know, maybe there's no guarantee, but make sure, I said, make sure Jesus is in your boat. And that made the hugest difference for her and uh, ran into her a few weeks later. And she's like, Jesus is in my boat, Bishop. Jesus is in my boat. I'm, and, and, it, and it worked, you know, it helped her. 
and uh, things did get better. And eventually the savior calmed her storm. And uh, anyway, that's just, that's just an example of the yeah. power that the scriptures have more than we do. I didn't teach her. The scriptures taught her and helped yeah. her. Yeah, I love that, that example because again, it's not, I, I remember um, growing up, I had this seminary teacher and I could like go to the seminary teacher and ask him like any question. And he'd like go to his scriptures and oh, go here and open up and right there, there's the answer. I was like, whoa, that's incredible. And then when I was bishop, I felt like I got to be that guy. You know, I got to be able to flip open and point at a verse and be like, there's your answer. But I love that in your example, it's more of like, no, you're like inviting them to engage with the scripture. Like here's a, vo or here's a scripture, right? Where, where are you in this, in this story? Right. And yeah. it, that's where the power is. Suddenly that power ignites and, and it really brings comfort and hope in, in several different circumstances. Right. And that's uh, I think really, that's what we've got to do. That's our job as teachers um, to not center our lesson on again, like the, our personality, our charisma, um, a technique, uh, our knowledge even, but our job is to help our students see relevancy. That's my key word. That's the word I'm always thinking of. How do I help them to see the relevancy of the scriptures to them? Because a lot of people wonder, they, they, say, they, they might even say, you know, how does something that happened 200 years ago or 2000 years ago or 6,000 years ago really have to do about living in the year 2020? And, and my answer to that is a lot more than you might think. Uh, Heavenly Father, but the scriptures deal in, in principles, in general truths that were just as true for Adam and Eve as they were for Peter at the time of Christ, as they are for Joseph Smith, as they are for us today. And sometimes our students just need a little bit of help to see the relevancy of, of the scriptures. So... For example, um, you know, if I ask some of my students, uh, I, teach, I teach middle schoolers, so I ask them, what's your favorite story in the Book of Mormon? And a lot of the boys are like, Ammon, I love the story of Ammon. And I'm like, why? Because that's when he cuts off all the arms. I think that's so cool. And I say, that's great. I'm glad you love that story. But if that's all you get from that story, you've missed the point, right? Uh, that story's in there. It, it, in one way, you know, in, in one way, to teach us how to be a missionary. Ammon teaches us how to be a great missionary. Um, when Jesus multiplies the loaves and the fishes, uh, if all I get from that is, wow, I wish, uh, you know, I could get a free lunch from, from Jesus, um, then, then we've missed the point, really. It's, that's not why he did it for them. In fact, some of the people the next day wanted him to do it again. And he's like, that's not why I did it, guys. It was there to teach you a lesson. I'm trying to teach you something about my word and that my word can fill you and satisfy you and feed you. And there's always going to be more left over for future feasts. That's why I did the miracle. That's why the story is in there. Or uh, the parting of the Red Sea, you know, um, that's a big one. You say, if there was any miracle in the scriptures you could see, if you wanted to witness, people choose that one. It's like, I'd love to see Moses part the Red Sea. And then say, well, what do you get out of that story? God is powerful, and that's cool. I'm like, great, that's wonderful. But that's not the point. I think you've missed the point in that story. Where's the relevancy to me? And I look at that story, and I say, hmm, you know what? I felt like the Israelites before. I've been in situations where I felt trapped, hedged in on all sides, like there's nowhere to go. And if I look to the prophet, if I have faith, if I'm willing to take a step forward in faith, God can miraculously open the way for me, for my escape. And if I look at it that way, I say, wow, I have seen that miracle in my life. I've seen the Red Sea part a number of times where my heavenly father stepped in and opened the way for me to escape. So that's kind of, I think that's our number one job is to, to find the relevance. And the sooner you can establish that, the better as a teacher. If you can give your students a reason to come on that journey and early in the lesson, then, then they'll, they'll go with you, right? They'll come with you and they'll, they'll experience that with you. So maybe near the beginning of a lesson, 
I'll say, you know, just ask them a question that, that hopefully kind of brings them to the, one of the truths that's in the lesson. So how many of you have faced incredibly difficult challenges and you couldn't see any purpose behind the adversity? And people will raise their hand. It's like, ah, Joseph of Egypt has something to teach you today. Let's let him teach you what to do in those situations. How many of you have ever been in a situation where your standards were challenged and everybody around you didn't seem to know what to do? Uh, Captain Moroni has something to teach you today. Have you ever been confused? Have you ever, uh, you know, with all the things that people are saying, have you ever not known where to go or what to do to find the truth? Joseph Smith is going to teach you something today. He's going to teach you what to do when you feel confused, when everybody's throwing their opinion out there and, and you want to know the truth. You want to come to a, a certain conclusion on something. Yeah. That's, that's what we're doing as teachers. Is, is, uh, that's my key word for almost any teacher is relevance, relevance, relevance. Yeah. Help your students find the relevance. And so I, I, as far as like um, balancing that is because there's this, component to teaching where you always feel like there's a there's a right answer to this scripture as far as like this this story means something specific and i need to make sure i know what that means so that i can teach in my class but there's a balance of like you sharing the relevance of that to maybe others other people but also them finding their own relevance in it and it could be it could be slightly different right and that's okay is is there a balance there yeah that's a that's another good balance like you said that's kind of a theme here too is uh in teaching, you got to be a good acrobat. Um, you yeah. got to balance a lot of things. And that's one of those things you don't want to, with questions, right? When you're asking questions and discussion questions, I find the best questions are the ones that are open-ended, right? You're not trying to pigeonhole anybody into one specific interpretation of that story. So you kind of bring them along. You can... Uh, you know, introduce them to the characters, lead them through the story. And then you ask them, okay, well, what do you see? And you can kind of prime the pump a little bit with some of these because some of the stories in the scriptures uh, maybe are a little bit more difficult than others. So we can maybe grease the wheels a little bit and, and kind of lead them or show them a way that it applies to you, but to always leave it open, to always leave it open to them. Like, so here's what Joseph of Egypt did. Here's what Joseph Smith did. Here's what Captain Moroni did. What do you see? How can that help us in similar situations? And what I see is that that discussion can go a number of different ways. Um, you know, one person sees it this way and another person sees it that way. And you as a teacher see it a different way. And, and that's awesome. Um, and all of those things can be shared and more people in the class uh, can connect with one person's application than somebody else's. But, but yeah, definitely you got to be careful about uh, trying to lead them down one specific path when you're teaching. Yeah, that's helpful. So what's next as far as, uh, is there anything else as far as in the realm of relevancy or, or creating, uh, stimulating relevance with the scriptures? Well, you know, I think, uh, Something that, uh, that, I, that helps me to understand my role as a teacher and, and helping, helping my students uh, experience the scriptures and the truths of the scriptures is uh, as analogy, I like the analogy of the tour guide. Um, we're kind of like a, a tour guide. And uh, my dad, my dad's, that's what he does now. Um, his job is he travels the world and he teaches people you know, about the history and the culture and the religions uh, of the, the places that people are visiting. And he's really, really good at it. He's an amazing teacher. And, uh, you know, I, I think our job is to kind of be that tour guide. Now, do people pay all that money to just go listen to the tour guide? No, no, that's not why they go. You wanna go see the sites, right? Mm -hmm. I wanna see Jerusalem. I wanna see the Great Wall of China. Um, I want to see the, the leaning tower, right? You don't want to have the tour bus drive up to the, to the site and then the tour guide gets up and gives this one hour long lecture and then the tour bus pulls away. Everybody's like, no, no, we want to, we want to go see. We want to go see what's out there. Yeah. 
So the, the site is the scriptures. So and that kind of goes back to the thought that we don't have to create the power. The power is already there. We're just guiding people there. We're just taking them there. But on the other hand, a tour guide can really make a big difference. Um, you don't want the tour guide that just drops you off and says, well, there's the site, go check it out. Um, you kind of want a little something. You want them to, to guide you a little bit. So you as the tour guide, you get up and you're like, okay, guys, uh, here's the site. Let me tell you just a little bit about it. Um, I've been here before. I've, I've, I've walked around the, the grounds. There's a couple places you want to check out. You want to, there's a really great photo opportunity right over in this spot. And don't make sure that you don't miss this over here. But let me help you understand why this place is relevant, why this place is important, why we're here, why people even care about coming. Now you go out and experience it and you go see it and then you come back with your experiences and your pictures and your stories and then we can talk about it and, and see what you learned. But I'm here to help, you know, I can, I can answer some of your questions. I've, I've got some experience with this. Um, I've been here before. And then we take them out there and uh, we, we let them see it. Now, uh, sometimes where a good tour guide can really come in handy is sometimes there's sites that may not seem that impressive on first, at first glance. Like uh, in some places, you know, I'm thinking of uh, going to Israel, been to the Holy Land. And I remember one time the tour bus pulled over to the side of the road in front of this very average looking valley you know there's this little valley between two hills not much to look look at you know it's like why are we here what, what are we what does this have to do with anything and we get off the tour bus and my dad says all right now this this is the valley of elah right? this is where david faced off against goliath now can you see these two hills can you picture the philistines over here and can you can you picture the, the Israelites over here? And then do you see this, this small boy with a, with a slingshot in his hand coming out to face this giant, you know, fully armed? And, and all of a sudden, that sight changes. And you're like, people are taking pictures and selfies and like, this is so cool. And it makes all the difference in the world. Sometimes there's... there's a, Scripture chapter, there's chapters like that sometimes, or verses that maybe somebody who's just kind of coming along, they look at that story and they're like, ah, it just looks like, you know, a valley. Like, well, what's here? And you as a teacher can kind of bring it to life and, and show them the relevance. Here's why this is important. Here's some thoughts. Here's, here's something that you can, you can take a look at. And, uh, People come walking away from those verses, those chapters, and they're like, wow, I never saw that before. That's really amazing. That's really cool. Yeah. So that's what we got to do. We got to try to, you know, some of the chapters are easier. Some stories, again, they're just like the Great Wall of China. Others are more the Valley of Elah. And you got to help them see the power of the site. We've got to be good tour guides. Now, I love that analogy because, I mean, tour guide really does give it, 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 it um, encourages people or gives them a reason to explore it, right? I, I, I can think of a few times I've had a tour guide where he, he's sort of verbose and he just, okay, I get it. Like, I don't need every last detail about every last thing here. Give me kind of a framework, somewhere to start. And then I want to go explore. I want to go see what I can learn for myself or I'll pick the, you know, the, the plaques that I'm going to read rather than listening to them the whole time. So there's that, uh, you sort of invite them into, into wherever you're exploring and then giving them reason to explore. Right. Yeah. It's like, uh, you know, this the balance idea again, right? You don't want to be the tour guide that just takes over and just reads off uh, the lecture, you know, for an hour long. And then you've got five minutes to look at the site. You also don't want to be the tour guide that just shoves them off the bus and says, Hey, go check it out. Um, we, we, again, we don't have to create the power of the site. It's there. But I could take that to the extreme as a teacher and just say, well, if the scriptures have all the power, let's just sit here and read. You know, we'll just read straight through verse by verse and say, uh, okay, what did you think? What did you think? You know, we can't do that either. We got to find that middle ground. But uh, yeah, I mean, if we're, if we're in the scriptures, 
if we're taking them to the site, it's gonna, it's gonna produce the experience. It's gonna give them the experience. And we're just there to kind of help them, help them through that experience or to enhance it. Yeah. So what would you say to the teacher who just feels a lot of pressure to, um, because I mean, you hear some of these, you know, BYU scholars that do the, you know, uh, Jerusalem tours and things, and they just know so much about the history, you know, the Truman Madsen, you know, he, he could, he just knows everything about everything there, you know? And so, but suddenly there's this pressure as a teacher feeling like, okay, I have to know like the socioeconomic conditions of when David, you know, marched out to, <laughs> to, to face the <laughs> Goliath. And, you know, how do we not put so much pressure of being this all knowing tour guide that can give all these cool perspectives, but can still bring the power and inspire people to, to explore. Yeah. Again, I think it's, it's the word you just focus on the word, the scriptures themselves. Um, I may take, you know, that's great. I mean, that information is awesome. And I know a lot of teachers who they are just, they're, they're Bible scholars. They know the history, the geography, um, the, uh, the culture. And that's great. And a lot of people love that, but I don't think you have to know all that. In fact, what we get in the manuals is probably mm -hmm. enough. I mean, they're going to give you at least a little bit, enough of the context to make it, to make it powerful. But I, I know a lot of teachers that they'll spend a lot of time, so much time in that, that again, we're not really getting much from the scriptures. Mm -hmm. the, the other mistake, again, balance here, the other mistake, we can go too far on the other side. And some people want to spend all the time on the other side of the scriptures, which is what comes out of them. So we, we're, we're studying Doctrine and Covenants 10, and they read verse 5. And verse 5 says, uh, pray always that you may come off conqueror. And so they think, oh, great, you know, here, a lesson on prayer. I, I'll just talk about prayer. So they read the verse, and then it's all stories. Like, here's a time when I had an answer mm -hmm. to prayer. And, and then they ask a question, how many of you have ever had an answer to prayer? And then it's, and we never get back to the scriptures. And we really haven't, we've talked about prayer, but we haven't learned what Doctrine and, Covenant, Doctrine and Covenants 10 teaches us about prayer. So you can err on one side or the other, but I found that the real power is right there in the words themselves. I don't have to worry tons. I use some of the background and the historical stuff and the cultural stuff to kind of help to lead me into the verses so I understand them better. And I may tell a story and I might use some illustrations to kind of enhance or to help people see the relevancy or the application, but I, I'm going to stay firmly rooted and anchored in the scriptures. Yeah. So I'm like, all right, so, so here's some background information, but how does that help us to understand this verse? Can you see why that's why he uses this word here? And, and all of my questions always, I always want to try to tie them back to the scriptures in, in some way. So it's not just like, okay, here, this is talking about prayer. What do you know about prayer? It's like, okay, what, did, what does this teach us about prayer? What does this chapter teach you about prayer? What blessings came to this individual because of this? And then you ask, and then even my application questions are still tied to the scriptures. And I say, when have you seen that happen in your life? When have you received the blessing that Enos received or the brother of Jared received? Because he had faith when he was praying. And, yeah. and it always, I always try to keep it centered and tied to the word. Because like I said, that's where the power lies. That's, that's where it's at. Yeah. And that can be really tough because, you know, you may read that scripture on prayer. And even as the instructor, you had no intention of staying on that verse the whole time, but then, you know, hands start popping up and then suddenly the time spent, you think, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, we spent all our time on that verse, which, you know, in some instances, that's not a bad thing, but to really model this, that, you know, we're, we're discovering a, a, a principle in the scriptures and then we're going to come back. Like, why was that there? You know, what else happens in this in this section that's going to better explain why it even talked about prayer in the first place. Right. So the, again, it's that sort of back and forth that you don't want to find a verse and then just run with it, but always come back. Right. And, and yeah. Yeah. And you do, you want to allow that a little bit. You can let them run with it a while. You, 
we don't need to be worried about finishing the lesson. Um, right. That's uh, if that's your again that that becomes unbalanced. That's not then that's your center. Your center and your focus is I got to finish my lesson plan, um, and that is probably not going to be edifying or or really lead people through. There they're going to maybe want to stay on one spot because that's what's connecting with them at that moment. So yeah, don't feel like you have to cover everything, but by the same token, don't, you know, you want to keep, you do want to guide them and you want to keep it, you do want to keep it centered in the word. Yeah. What would you say to the teacher who, cause I know sometimes the scriptures can be sort of, uh, I don't know what the right word is like, they're sort of scared of the scriptures as far as like, I don't know how to interpret these things. So I'm just going to go to the manual and, oh, the manual says this. So I'm going to say that. But sometimes we're afraid to sort of sit with it and say, you know, this is what I think it means. And I may be wrong, but what else are you seeing? I mean, what would you say to that teacher who's kind of scared to take a step forward of interpretation? Yeah, I, I give you my best advice. And it comes down to three things, really. Um, because some people, I think, look at what we do or what a teacher does, a seminary teacher, you know, and I've had years of, of, of practice and experience. I mean, I teach five gospel lessons a day for the past 20 years. So, so but people look at that and they're like, oh, what would you do? Finding these insights or finding the message of the scriptures like it's magic. And, <laughs> and, and I'm a, I am an amateur magician. I'm not that great, but I, I do do it a little bit and I have fun with my classes. But uh, you know, I'll do a magic trick and somebody comes up like, how did you do that? And I'm like, uh, it's magic, you know, but it really isn't right. There's a real right. explanation behind it. There was some practice. There was some things that go into it. So sometimes after a lesson, somebody will say something similar. It's like, how do you find that? Like, I must have read that story a thousand times. Like, I've never seen that before. And I say, I think the problem is we, we haven't, I think a lot of people read the scriptures but they don't study the scriptures. And there's a difference saying, like maybe we're just sitting down and we're just scratching the surface or we're getting the chapter done or we're, we're going through. If you want to find insight in the scriptures, if you want to find the relevance, it's not magic. <laughs> um, and, and I would boil it down to three things. Slow down, ask questions and ponder. Hmm that that's it that that's what i do is it that's how i prepare lessons now i i also i mean i think it's okay to get things from the manual and you know i uh, i've gotten insights from my father and from other teachers and that's great but if we haven't connected personally with them then i think we're going to struggle we could i mean we could get up and read somebody else's script and it won't have any power because we haven't connected to that but that that's how you do it i i tell my students i kind of joke with them I say, hey, uh, come by after school sometime and just peek into my window. I say, if you were to do that, you might look into my office and I'll be sitting there with my feet up on the desk, you know, kind of looking off into space and, you know, and just kind of sitting there. And you might be tempted to think, gosh, you know, Brother Wilcox is lazy. You know, what's he doing in there? He's just sitting there. He's just relaxing. And I tell them, actually, what you're witnessing you're seeing the hardest work I do all day because I'm, I'm, I'm pondering. That's my preparing. Some of the best insights, some of the best scripture study you will do is when you're not even looking at the page. You're not even looking at the words. I, I, I'm reading and I, I, I come to it and I think, and then I start asking myself questions like, okay, why did he use that word? Why did that character act that way? Why, did, why was that the result? Why did God bless this individual in this way? And I'm just asking questions. And then you've got to give the spirit room to answer. So you kind of look away. And I, you know, I put my feet up on the desk and I just, I just think. And that's when the spirit is there to teach. And, and I don't think they're my ideas at all. Right. Uh, any of the ideas that I give are usually the bad ones. It's the spirit that gives all the good ideas. <laughs> um, so I can't, you know, we can't take as teachers, we can't take any of the credit. Um, but, but that, that would be my advice. You want to find relevancy in the scriptures, slow down, ask questions and then ponder. Yeah. 
And then the spirit's going to help you. And you'll find things. You will. Just try it. I just say, just try it. Uh, don't, don't say, oh, yeah, you know, I can't do that. I'm not a scriptorian. I don't know anything about the scriptures. Anybody, a brand new convert of the church could come up with amazing insights. And I know this because I teach, I teach middle schoolers who some of them who probably haven't done much in the scriptures at all. And I just ask them a question that helps them to ponder and just get them thinking. And they teach me stuff, right? I'm, I'm like, oh, I got to write that down. Right? That's, that's a good insight. I got to remember that one. Yeah. Anybody can do this. Um, it's, it's because, again, we're not the power. The, the yeah. scriptures have it. So we just got to give it. We got to got a spirit. We've got to give the spirit a conduit to, to teach it to us. Yeah. And, and I love that as far as, you know, when you say some, we got to, we can't just read the scriptures. We have to study the scriptures. And sometimes when I hear that, I think, okay, so I need to like learn Hebrew so that I know the roots of like all these words, right? Like that's what study the scriptures. But I love how you, you give that those three, uh, perspectives because a lot of studying the scriptures sometimes you just sit with it for a minute and you ponder and you let it digest right it doesn't mean you have to become a you know dead sea scroll phd expert to study the scriptures i mean sometimes it is interesting to look at the root words or hebrew or greek or whatever but but to study the scripture it, again it goes back to those questions and slowing down and pondering right and that's mm -hmm. that's where the beginning of where it will lead you to to deep study and really internalizing and applying the scriptures for yourself. Yeah. And I think that's what people really, most people, that's what they want in a gospel lesson in a gospel teaching scenario. Um, they probably don't care so much about who the Nicolaitans were or the Hebrew word for boat or some gospel scholars ideas about Kolob. You know, that, that's great, but what they're probably really wanting, what I think they want more, they want to know how the scriptures can help them with their marriage that's struggling. Mm -hmm. They want to know how the scriptures can get them through their crisis of faith. They want to know how uh, what they're studying can, can help them with their son or daughter that's rebelling. You know, that's, that's the stuff that I look for. That's what I really want to focus my attention on. And, and what I find really usually is the most edifying. There are some things that are interesting, um, but I want to edify my students. I want them to leave rejoicing. I don't want them to just be blessed for going to my class. Um, I want them to be blessed by the class, you know, because uh, sometimes I think we are. I was like, well, you know, at least I'll get blessings for going, but I want them to be blessed by the the experience that they've had yeah so those are the things that i think are really going to bless them yeah are the personal and relevant i think things. as you model these things as you do through your teaching like they leave the class realizing oh i don't need ben wilcox in the room with me to learn from the scriptures right like mm -hmm. i see what he's doing and i can do that too and that's encouraging especially for you know youth who are trying to figure out the gospel in general it's encouraging for them to know i'm empowered to find the power myself that's great and everybody has that ability. Yeah. I mean, I don't think anybody, you don't have to teach for years and years. You don't have to have a degree, you know, in, in order to learn from the scriptures. God made these, you know, to, to help everybody, yeah. to help the gospel scholar and, you know, the, the brand new convert who just joined the church last week. The scriptures are there for everybody and everybody can access that power. It's, Love it. it's, it's baked in. It's there. <laughs> so what are we missing as, as we wrap up here? Any points or perspectives that, uh, that we need to make sure we cover before we wrap up? Oh, I think that uh, that's really what I wanted to, to share most. Again, like I said at the beginning, it's, that's more of a, a broad kind of perspective. It's more of a big picture perspective, but I think that's important when you're the person who's been assigned to teach or you want to teach your family and you want to teach with power um, to just remember that focus and that approach to it. Um, that's what's going to, that's what's going to lead the scriptures to be an edifying, powerful experience for you as a teacher and for those that you're teaching. Yeah. 
So I got one more question for you, but uh, before I ask that question, uh, where would you send people if they want to know more about you? And obviously I think your, your YouTube channel is sort of home base for you, right? Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, the best place to go is uh, teachingwithpower.com. Um, I really started out with the YouTube channel, but then it's kind of grown from there because people, some people are like, hey, I, I want to get some of your questions or do you have this uh, in a transcript? And so I started the blog that has lesson plans, you know, people can actually go and they can, they can see some of those thoughts and some of those questions. And then uh, some people were saying, well, hey, your videos are based on these PowerPoint slide presentations. Can I get those? And so now I've got a shop that you can, you can actually get uh, the slides if you want those to use in, in a lesson. And then uh, just recently, people have been asking about a podcast, like put this as a podcast. So I've just recently put it out as a podcast. So it's okay. kind of just grown. And, but YouTube, yeah, is, is kind of my home base there. But if you go to teachingwithpower.com, it has the links to each of those places. Cool. All right. Final question I have is yeah. uh, if you're in front of a room full of brand new teachers uh, who are nervous to get started and they want to do a good job, what final encouragement would you give them to teach? Like I would say, hey, be patient with yourselves, right? Be patient. Um, uh, realize that you don't have to create the power. You don't have to be on stage. Uh, just trust in the scriptures, trust in the spirit, and the spirit and Heavenly Father will do the rest. If you can just put it in their hands. Mm -hmm.